Hi everyone, my name is Mike, and I'd like to welcome you to this presentation of Message in a Bubble, Principles of Passive Acoustic Mapping for Biomedical Cavitation Monitoring. Why are we here? We're here because of the broad range of physical actions and biological responses that bubbles can provide for us. So for example, a spherically oscillating bubble near a cell will induce stresses in the cell membrane, leading to a temporary poration of that membrane, which is useful for drug delivery. If the bubble happens to be oscillating with a non-spherical component, such as may happen when the bubble is near the wall of a blood vessel, for example, then we'll see a circulatory flow, which is useful for drug distribution and transport. Absorption of bubble acoustic emissions can greatly enhance local heat deposition, which is useful for drug release and ablation. And finally, in the face of extremely strong cavitation activity, we can erode tissue, and this is seen in hystertripsy and thrombolysis techniques. Now, this is a very abbreviated list here, and so I do recommend that you have a look at the Thunder Live videos from Eleanor Stride and Dario Carugo, as well as the papers I've listed below, just for starters. In recent years, we've seen several therapeutic ultrasound techniques either in or headed to clinical trial. And each of these requires a specific type or dose of cavitation activity that can vary in time and location and certainly can be patient specific. And the specific type of cavitation you want may be to the exclusion of others. So it makes some sense that we're gonna to wanna to keep an eye on whatever the bubbles are doing, both to make sure that you get the desired bioeffects and that you deliver the therapy safely. Okay, so we want to keep track of bubble activity. So what exactly can we observe in vivo? Well, I've tried to summarize the answer to that question in this diagram here, where I'm showing the different bio effects inside these green shapes. And these red dots here indicate approximately best spatial resolution of the imaging modalities summarized here, CT, MRI, PET, and both active and passive ultrasound. So for example, uh, MRI has evolved as a fantastic method of imaging temperature elevations superimposed over anatomic data. But it turns out that for some therapies, temperature elevation is not the whole story or it's not the relevant story at all. And if you really want to keep track of what the bubbles themselves are doing, what kind of cavitation is occurring, and what that cumulative dose is, then you're probably better off turning to sound scattering methods. Now, these can be broadly lumped into two classes, the first of which is active, and it's exactly what you think it is, uh, that in addition to a therapy pulse that has to be transmitted in order to perform the therapy itself, there's an additional imaging transmission that occurs. And this is usually interwoven with the therapy pulse so that what you're monitoring is actually the state of bubbles between therapy pulses rather than during them. By contrast, the passive methods simply listen to whatever bubble activity results from the therapy pulses being applied, and therefore we can monitor during the therapy itself, and we think that this is most relevant for keeping track of bubble activity. So these are the kinds of methods that I'm going to talk about from here forward. Now I'd like to show you an illustration of passive monitoring for a therapeutic ultrasound treatment scenario. So here I've got a focused ultrasound source transmits into a target liver tumor, creates cavitation. The resulting acoustic emissions are received on a handheld ultrasound array and beam formed over a CT or B mode to give us anatomic information. And that's an important point about all these passive methods that they do need to be paired up with something else to give you the anatomy. Uh, B mode certainly is a physically convenient way to do this. I also want to point out here that I'm using the acronym PAM for passive acoustic mapping, that's terminology we use here at Oxford and then we'll use for the rest of this talk. To explain about how the beamforming really works, I'm going to employ a diagram provided by Callum Craig a couple of years ago. So supposing we've got two sources, one at a point of interest that we're going to image and another one here in red at another point that we would consider an interfering source. So we receive data from both on our array channels. We apply time delays so that we steer to the point of interest. And then from here, we've got a choice about how we can proceed. So we follow this upper, upper track here that's highlighted in green. 
If we don't do anything else with the signals before we combine them, we see that the output of the beamformer is that we get a pretty good representation of what was at the point of interest, but also with incomplete suppression of the interferer. However, if we optimize the array weights, that is, how we amplify each of the array signals before combining them, and we do this every time we get new data, these so-called adaptive beamformers will give us, again, a pretty good representation of the signal at the point of interest, but with much better source suppression of the interferer. In case you thought this presentation was all words and pictures, here's a math slide. Our beamformer output is an estimate of the monopolar source energy emitted from each grid point that we're imaging. The basis of this calculation is the data covariance matrix, capital RS. We see that it's scaled here by the element weights, W, and the estimates of tissue properties, rho and C. You can see from the second line here that RS is calculated with pre-steered array data. And all that means is that we correct the data first using a free space greens function based on the distance between the elements and the imaging point so that for each imaging point, the residual steering vector is just a vector of ones. So how do we get the weights out of this? Well, for that, I'll run through a list of some of the beamformers we use. The first of these is called Time Exposure Acoustics, TEA, and it's non-adaptive, and it turns out that the weights aren't pre-calculated in the sense that they're all uniform and they never change. Strictly speaking, this doesn't have to be the case. We could, for example, use a taper window as is common in sonar, for example, to reduce side lobes, but we don't do that here. The first adaptive beamformer is called the Capon, or the Minimum Variance Distortionless Response, or the Sample Matrix Inversion Beamformer. And here we're solving a minimization problem using sort of the core of the energy estimate, with the constraint that when you add up all the weights, they add up to unity. And this is an example of what a former program manager of mine used to call a success-oriented strategy, meaning everything has to go right for it to work well. In our case, we need to have a good array calibration, and we need to have a pretty good idea about our environment. And if we don't, these methods can suffer. Improvements on these kinds of methods come in many forms, but this is a good one here, the robust Capon beamformer. And here we're solving a similar looking minimization problem, but the constraint equation has changed in two important ways. First, we allow the, the steering vector to change from its ideal state. And we bound this with a parameter epsilon. And the way to think about all this is that the larger epsilon is allowed to be, the more flexibility the beamformer has to suppress interferers. Now, both the Capon and the robust Capon beamformers operate on the second order statistics of the array data. But there's no particular reason to think that the cavitation data itself don't have higher order statistics. And in fact, there are beamformers that try to use that information. Here is one. And now the minimization problem involves looking at the L infinity norm of the weighted data itself, and once again constrained with an uncertainty bound. I won't talk about that one anymore, and instead I'll focus on TEA and RCB, these are beamformers that we use quite a bit in our lab, and both have been running as real-time capabilities for several years now. Okay, let's start looking at some examples. This is a simulation with a monopole at the origin of the imaging frame, emitting a broadband noise pulse that's received by a linear array receiver 54 millimeters away from the origin of coordinates. When I beamform this with the non-adaptive beamformer, TEA, we get a characteristic elongated response pattern in the axial direction and some tail features. If we beamform that same data with RCB, however, we get a much tighter pattern. We can get a better feel for this by looking at the axial PAM patterns. Near the origin where the source is, we see that TEA and RCB are doing about the same thing, but near about plus or minus one millimeter, RCB diverges quite strongly with a much better response. And if we want to understand how these things happen with an adaptive beamformer, it helps to look both at the weight functions and the resulting field sensitivities. So starting with our non-adaptive beamformer, TEA, steered to a location one millimeter past the origin, 
Well, first of all, the weights are all uniform, so there's nothing to calculate there. But if we look at the characteristic sensitivity pattern that results from steering to this location with those weights, we see that the beam pattern is fairly broad, and it's broad enough to capture and incorporate any source that exists at a location at the origin. And that is, in fact, what's happening here. However, if we look at what RCB weights are produced for the steering location, we see something that's quite different in size and shape. Two features I'd like to point out. First is that the end weights are quite heavily amplified. And this is the kind of thing you might do if you were trying to sharpen the directivity of an array. The other thing you may notice is that the polarity of the weights is changing a few times. And this is something you might consider doing if you were trying to introduce some nulls into the field pattern. And that is, in fact, what we see when we look at the RCB steered pattern to the same location as we saw before. If we look at these characteristic patterns on axis, again, if we look at the origin where the source is in this problem, we find that RCB is trying to dig a hole here to reduce its sensitivity. But both beamformers have the same gain for a source that's located at the steered location at uh, one millimeter past the origin. So that's really what's going on here. A further illustration now is if we implement two sources instead of one, here we've got a pair of monopoles that are separated by 3.6 millimeters total. Same broadband noise emissions. And just to make things a little bit more difficult, I lowered the channel SNR, but it's still pretty good. Here, the non-adaptive beamformer is not able to tell the two sources apart. And in fact, it also grows some additional tail features that are stronger in magnitude. But RCB is able to tell these apart quite nicely. Again, this is easier to see if we look at the axial patterns. And in particular, we see that RCB has done a nice job of drawing a minimum between the two source locations, and is also doing a pretty good job at estimating the source energies that are indicated by the black circles. Turning now to the characteristic sensitivity patterns of the beamformers, and we're steering now to the point between sources at the origin. We see again that the TEA sensitivity pattern is broad enough that even though we're steering to the origin, we're going to capture some of the energy from where the sources are. And that's why the TEA pattern is pretty well filled in. If we look at what RCB produces for the steering location, similar looking weights to what we had with a single source problem. And again, we see that there are some field minima introduced in the 2D pattern. If we look just at the on axis components of all this, we see that when we look along the origin, both beamformers have the correct gain. But when we look at where the sources are, we see that RCB has a reduced sensitivity. And this is why it performs better. Now, if you're looking really closely, you might notice that the minima in the RCB sensitivities is not perfectly aligned with where the sources are. And this is because of the bandwidth of the signal. We're feeding octave band data to the beamformer, and RCB is calculating kind of a best compromise for the weights to work over that entire bandwidth. If, in fact, we were giving it narrower band data, then we would see sharper nulls. And finally, I'll point out that at uh, distances further away from the origin, further away from the sources, the sensitivity patterns are enhanced quite a bit. And this is a result of RCB doing its uh, covariance calculations and deciding that there are no sources out there, so there's really no adverse consequence to letting those sensitivities be enhanced out there. All right, well, everything I've shown you so far has been with perfectly calibrated arrays. So supposing we continue with this two-source example that we had before, and here's the calibrated array result. Now, supposing of, instead of having a well-calibrated array, that calibration is out of date, or perhaps one of your well-meaning colleagues dropped the array on the floor after most recent calibration. And I've incorporated that in a simulation here where we introduce a 15% RMS element by element uncertainty in the calibration. And things uh, turn bad pretty quickly here. We see that the weights look like noise and the beamformer output looks, uh, well, essentially useless. However, 
if we allow the epsilon factor, which is how much we allow the beamformer to manipulate the steering weights, we see that this more or less recovers the good performance of the beamformer when we had a fully calibrated array. So this is one of the reasons that we like RCB, is it's very forgiving. Let's move on now to an experiment example. Instead of having two point sources, we now have two tubes filled with SonaView microbubbles flowing in and out of the page, and each is excited by a half megahertz source. The resulting signals are captured by the same linear array receiver as before, only now it's uncalibrated, it's further away, and the sources are close together. For this more difficult problem, neither beamformer is able to resolve the two source regions. And this is a consequence of the limited aperture and bandwidth of the receiver. However, there is something that we can do about it. And in this example, we've added a second array, this time at 90 degrees. This gives us an additional set of look angles and increases the total array aperture. And when we use this data to beamform with TEA, we see that we have a fighting chance of separating the two source regions, and it's even much better with RCB. Once again, if we want to understand why RCB is working so well, we have to look at the weights. So first we look at the origin, location between the two source regions, and the weights for the two arrays look quite different. The array at 90, which has a clean look at the origin, is upweighted considerably, while the array at zero is all but turned off. By contrast, when we look directly at one of the source regions, we find that both the arrays are weighted similarly. And this kind of behavior is observed throughout the imaging plane, and we do see that RCB makes effective use of available aperture. I'd like to turn now to a more realistic simulation scenario. Here we have 20 monopole sources randomly distributed inside of an ellipsoidal volume which emulates the main lobe of a HIFU source. The relative strengths of those sources is shown on the same color scale as in the PAM images. What we see in these images is even when RCB does a good job of constraining the energy mostly within the ellipsoidal volume, there is some tail artifact and there is a lot of blurring and blending, so we can't see much detail here. If we add in our second receive array, we do see that both TEA and RCB improve, RCB notably giving us more constraint of the energy pattern and giving us some more detail about what's going on inside. And finally, if we use an expanded array, this time a 180 degree arc with the same channel count as we had with the two arrays before, now we start getting some really nice detail about the source distribution. This kind of array has been used by the photoacoustics community for quite a while, and I think it has some use here for PAM as well. Okay, everything I've shown you up to now has either been from simulation or a simple experiment. I'd like to start now talking about clinical translation issues, starting with tissue path effects. The beamformers are set up assuming straight line paths between each imaging point in the array and only correcting for spherical spreading between each grid point in the array. Of course, that's not what really happens. And what we start with is the fact that we do lose energy to attenuation in the tissue. This shows up as a low energy estimate, and because we tend to preferentially lose high frequency information in this process, it costs us resolution as well. The non-uniform sound speed distribution gives us refraction, which gives us misregistered images and some degree of degraded resolution. Now, both of these things can be accounted for with some effort, but part of the challenge here is that the tissue properties may not be all that well known. Once the bubble signals do reach the array, the array itself can have a big influence on the beamformer output. The first thing that the signals reach when they hit the array is the covering lens, and owing to its low sound speed and curvature, we get some refraction through the lens which leads to misregistration of the PAM image and some loss of energy. 
The simple way to think about this is that there's a PAM-specific lens correction, and it's not the same thing as a B-mode lens correction. But a much, much larger effect comes from element diffraction. So here, the finite size of the array elements and the fact that they have an elevation focus leads to a very strong position dependence on their response. So both the position of the elements on the array and the position of the source will matter in terms of the response you see. I'm illustrating this here with calibrated responses of two commercially available arrays, curvilinear on the left, linear on the right, both for a source location 40 millimeters on axis away from the array. Looking first at the linear array, mid-band we see that there's about a 60 dB difference between the center and edge response levels, and that may not seem like that much, but it is a big deal for the adaptive beamformers which like to upweight the edges of the array. Certainly a much bigger effect is seen with the curved linear array because now we've taken some acoustically large elements and rotated them around a curved surface. Now we see a couple of orders of magnitude in the range of response in the primary operating band for this array. We can see the position dependence a bit more clearly if we focus on a single frequency. So using the data I showed you on the previous page, now we're just looking at 4.5 megahertz. Same two arrays, two different depths, 40 and 80 millimeters. Looking first at the L74, the linear array, we have about a 6 to 8 dB difference between edge and center response levels, just about flat if we go twice as far away. With the curved linear array at the same frequency, we see that even though the physical aperture is larger, the array of directivity effects essentially shut off that aperture, and in fact you end up with something smaller than the linear array. At the close ranges, you have an additional complexity that we go from what appears to be a main lobe response into the first side lobes, and that's associated with a phase flip. And if you don't tell the beamformer that this is happening to your data, then you're going to get some strange looking results. Overall, there is this trade-off with curvilinear arrays. They're nice for clinical B-mode because they give you a wide field of view, but it's not at all clear that for PAM, that aperture is at all useful. So how does this all accumulate? Well, to illustrate this, I did a simulation based on a liver treatment scenario. So I started by segmenting tissue from a CT scan of a patient we treated a few years ago. You see this in the lower left. The red mark indicates the location of a virtual broadband source, transmitting with a wider bandwidth than we used before, 1 to 10 megahertz. Receiving that with a C52 array and using RCB for beamforming. Now, before we add any tissue properties into this, if we just beamform with water, we get the image we see here. It's a little bit blockier than what we saw before, and that's because of two reasons. One is the expanded bandwidth, particularly at the low side, and also because we're using a wider dynamic range in the plot, and you'll see why in a moment. So now if we just add in the array calibration data that I showed you before, that is to say the signals are influenced by the array if it was uncalibrated, then we get a much broader beam pattern. And this is because a lot of the high-frequency data has been lost because of the array response. And we also see that the main lobe seems to be spread out a bit, almost seems to have two lobes, and I'll focus in on that a little bit more. If we further add tissue complexities, so that's attenuation and a sound speed complexity, we now have, in addition to a broad spot, we see that it's shifted several millimeters, and we've grown a response tail in the PAM image. If we look only at the axial beam patterns, starting with water, we see that we get a response where we expected it, and it's fairly narrow. When we add the array response, now we go to a situation where we have, instead of one distinct peak, we have two. And it wouldn't be clear, if you were imaging with this, which one was which if either, in terms of its uh, relevance to where the cavitation occurred. And when you include the tissue effects, we see the large shift. Now, one of the peaks has shifted as much as 8 millimeters away from where the actual source was, and we've lost about 8 dB in amplitude. So you might look at this and say, well, we've got some real problems here when we try to do this in vivo for 
clinical therapy monitoring. But take heart. I think we can fix this. And in fact, methods for correcting for several of these effects are either available in the literature now or are imminent. So that covers diffraction, lens effects, uh, and path attenuation, which I want to briefly highlight here. I mentioned earlier that sometimes tissue properties are not all that well known in a patient-specific way. And so one way we can get at this is to actually use PAM to tell us what the attenuation was. So in this illustration here, we get an original PAM image without any compensation. Based on the PAM data, we calculate where we think sort of the center of mass is of the cavitation activity, beamform to that spot, look at the summed spectrum of that response, and if your array is properly calibrated, then the residual slope of that frequency response tells us what the effect of attenuation was along that path to that location. The third and last translation issue that I wanted to bring up here is that of calculation time. So how do we ensure that the calculations we do for the beamforming and for the various compensation processes mentioned on the previous slide can all be completed fast enough so that PAM won't be a rate-limiting process for the therapy? Well, I've long been a proponent of the idea that if you have more calculations to do in less time, get yourself a better computer. And of course, it's not as bad as this. We've had real-time versions of the codes running for a few years now. But certainly, there are plenty of things we can do to speed things up even further. One of these comes from array element usage. In a recent study, we were able to show that we could use only one-eighth of the array elements without any meaningful loss of image quality, while still accelerating the speed of RCB calculations by about a factor of 20. And an important part of all this was using a non-uniform element spacing so that we suppressed grading lobes. Independently, you could do the beamforming in the frequency domain, as well illustrated in this Kevin Hayworth paper. For the modest cost of doing an FFT at the beginning, you end up with great selectivity in what information you pass to the beamformer. You can select a particular type of cavitation or just a very narrow band. Here, in this case, we have the upper image performed with ultra-harmonic data and the lower with broadband. But in both cases, you end up with much less data to feed into the beamformer, and that does speed things up. A further extension on frequency domain processing is to implement angular spectrum methods, here done by Costa Sarvanitas, and he's demonstrated some quite profound accelerations to PAM processing using this method. One further note, keep an eye out for sparsity methods. There's quite a bit of work going on in this area, and it's something to look forward to. The last bit of data I'd like to show you is a clinical example from PAM recorded during a liver treatment. So the scenario is shown here on the left. We have focused ultrasound treating a solid liver tumor, and we're listening in on therapy with a C52 array. The resulting PAM images are superimposed on a section of the CT on the right, and PAM was calculated using the RCB algorithm and a patient-specific sound speed estimate. And we can see that even though the cavitation activity was occurring pretty far from where the array was listening, about 11 centimeters in this case. Quite clearly, cavitation monitoring in vivo with a handheld array is feasible. Okay, to summarize, passive acoustic mapping can be used at any time during a therapeutic ultrasound transmission, allowing us to localize and quantify different types of cavitation activity that may be useful for a particular therapeutic application. And we can do this with arbitrary bandwidth data. This method is subject to the limitation that there is no anatomic referencing built in, so it does need to be paired with something else like B mode or CT, and the results are subject to receiver bandwidth and aperture. Going forward, there's still plenty of work to do, including trying to work out 3D imaging using a 2D handheld array, and there's certainly plenty of more work that can be done in terms of beamforming algorithms. This is a quite live and ripe research area, 
And there's a lot of good work going on right now that you'll be hearing about, I'm sure, very soon. But in the meantime, there's quite a bit more to uncover. So by all means, keep digging. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging all the people that I've worked with over the years and all the people in the PAM community who have influenced the work that you've seen today. I'll start with the home team at the University of Oxford under the leadership of Constantine Kousios. A lot of people have worked on this over the years, more than a decade now. I've listed Catherine and Cameron last because they're two of the newer people in the lab who are making really nice contributions to the field. It should be available in publication form very soon. I also want to highlight foundational efforts at the University of Cincinnati, at Sunnybrook Research Institute, and at Harvard with Professor Arvanitas getting double billing because he's continued his work since going to Georgia Tech. So thanks again for joining me for this presentation, and I sincerely hope that I can see some of you in person very, very soon.